All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Denver by Mary Grothy. How are you doing, Mary? Hey, good morning. I'm having a good start to my day. How about yourself? Excellent. Always great. Always a great start <laughs> to the day here in San Diego. What can I say? And um, Mary is the CEO of Sales BQ and Sales BQ, you know, help companies uh, with, with growth and revenue. And that's why what I wanted to talk ab about with Mary today is so how can CEOs and VPs or sales leaders, how can they, number one, assess whether they their sales team is the right one or performing in the right way? And if not, how can they build or indeed rebuild a high-performing sales team? So, Mary, when you engage with, with companies, how do you help them assess the state of their sales organization? The first thing we do is we get into the metrics. I often find that sales leaders and CEOs have a lot of opinions about the talent of their sales staff. And unfortunately, there's a big emotional tie-in to those. And I don't enjoy trying to solve a problem that's based on emotion. I need to get into the numbers. I need to get into the metrics. So, the, so tip number one is to get your CRM up and running with the KPIs and metrics that you need to make profitable decisions for your sales department. So a lot of sales leaders don't put in the right infrastructure, systems, processes, and metrics to track the behavior. So BQ is a behavioral quotient. Mm. We want to be able to have visibility into the trends of where people are spending their time and the effectiveness, so the leading and the lagging indicators. When we first go in to evaluate a sales team, we get the lay of the land and we want to understand, uh, first we'll look at the lagging indicators. How is everyone performing? That's a very mm -hmm. logical and sure. easy place to start. And we can look at year over year production. But then we dig in with each team member. So we're going to hear the emotional side of the person and then we're going to hear the data side of the person. So there are some top sales people that have been referred to in the industry, um, uh, specifically by Dave Curlin, as mavericks. Mm -hmm. These are your top sales people that you just don't put them near your other performers because the way that they get the job done is you can't replicate that with yep. your other mm -hmm. reps. By the way, I am a former maverick. <laughs> and I was a, a top seller, number one rep, top 10 rep. And it was fun trying to replicate my success, but I was kind of tough to deal with. And I needed to just be on my island and get the job done and crush the number. So those are your mavericks. Then you have your middle of the group reps. And what we want to understand when we look at the metrics is how is the success happening? We look at lead sources. One of my favorite exercises is to run the tw uh, trailing 12 months. Right. And I want to look at everything that was added to the pipeline. Where did it come from? Then we want to analyze. So that would be the lead source. Where mm -hmm. did it come from? Then we want to analyze the average revenue per sale. We're looking at the uh, length of time to close. If we won or we lost. Ultimately, Doing the lead source exercise when looking at the sales plan, it will tell you by rep, one, all the metrics that you need. So you're going to be able to see their top performing lead sources. Then you're going to be able to see um, their leading and lagging indicators. Of that length of time to close, I like to identify going back into the CRM if they're logging their calls, their emails, their LinkedIn mm -hmm. outreaches, their webinars, their events, everything that they're doing for top of funnel. How many touch points did it take one to get the meeting? How many meetings did it get to progress into qualified pipeline revenue? And where in the process did we win or lose from what stage? And if you can identify that by rep, that's where it tells you the story. Mm -hmm. In addition, we are certified partners of Objective Management Group. Right. And we'll use an assessment tool to look at their DNA and competencies to get further uh, scientific research on their if they're going to be able to perform in that role or not. But mm -hmm. data is always step number one. I do like to cut through the emotional connection right. that sales leaders and CEOs would have with some of those people. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you, I've walked into to a company before multiple times <laughs> where they have a rep who hasn't hit quota in two or three years, but they love, love that person yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they just can't get rid of them. And they're such a loyal, like brand ambassador. It's such a good person. Like you can like somebody when they work for a different company, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but if they can't cut it here, why do you keep them around? That's yeah. why you cut out the emotion. And, the, and let's face it. Uh, if you're not delivering on a consistent basis, but they keep you around, wouldn't that make you loyal? <laughs> Heck yeah. yeah. I get paid for doing a mediocre job. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So when you do when you do this analysis, what are some of the things that maybe surprise uh, sales leaders and CEOs when you do that initial analysis? 
their top reps aren't as talented as they think. Mm -hmm. Their top rep success can come from having the best territory. It could be from inheriting the best business. They're getting the best leads. They had two or three bluebirds that came Mm -hmm. in. And that is the biggest aha and awareness that they also um, often, <laughs> John, we don't get brought in when sales teams are performing, right? Sure. So we, no, we I get can, brought I in can, I can see that. Yeah. when they need help. And we've heard this story before. Well, this was our top rep for the last three years. And then all of a sudden the numbers have trailed off. But when we start looking back, it's like because year over year, there are these one or two deals that pushed this person Mm. over, but they never had the work ethic and they never had the leading indicators. So now we're on a down year because that bluebird hasn't happened or that big contract renewal didn't happen, whatever that has been carrying them. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we will find that the top performers, there's a lot more to the story and we can help these CEOs get ahead of them all of a sudden having a really bad year because we have visibility into the metrics. But that's a real common one mm-hmm. that we that we see. And and that gets back to what you were saying about the fact that uh, there's, there's a tendency for us to assume things or <laughs> to add one and one and get three, right? As opposed mm-hmm. to digging in because... Uh, it's still today, and I think this is probably what you find still today, everybody agrees that data-driven decision-making is a good thing, that metrics yes. are a good thing, but then they kind of file it under, well, it is a good thing, but it's too hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a lot of effort, isn't it? And some personality styles don't like getting into mm-hmm. the details. So if you're familiar with the disk profiles at all, sure. most executives and leaders have a high D and a high D doesn't have a lot of attention to detail, especially if they're mm-hmm. DI, if they're DC, then they can have their task oriented and, and they'll be a little bit more into the details, a little more analytical, but that DI leader is not going to want to touch that data. They are, and this is who I am, by the way, the DI. So I will fly by the seat of my pants. I will use gut instinct. I'm high urgency. I want to just go in there and get it done, but I do not like getting stuck in the details. So you have a lot of people in leadership that are DIs and it is, it, it's not natural for them to want to swim in the data. Mm-hmm. So a lot of high performing teams have a sales admin or a sales ops person. And I'm sure you've heard that sales sure. ops term. Mm-hmm. It has been, uh, I, I mean, just, increase significantly in some of these larger organizations. Mm-hmm. I've heard some sales leaders say that it should be your first hire when building out a high-performing sales team is somebody who will live in the data and the metrics. Sales people are expensive. Sales departments are expensive. And you watch these teams shell out thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the size of the team, but they're not even managing the data. Mm-hmm. And so they're working harder than they need to, or they're not working smart. They're throwing money out the window. If you can have the efficiency then you can have that profitability in your sales department. So once you start to analyze each of, each of them and you you know you do macro and you do micro analysis of uh, of the the lagging indicators how do you start what do you start to do next and and then talk to me about leading indicators because that's the one thing that I <laughs> I do find is that Everybody, everybody will look at lagging indicators, even whether they're accurate or not, you know, they'll still look at them. Sure. But very few people understand how to look at or how to use leading indicators. Correct. We have a saying around here that we that no one should ever be surprised if a rep misses quota mm-hmm. because deals don't close out of thin air. Mm-hmm. It, we should never have to wait for someone to miss quota before we realize we need to have disciplinary conversation because the numbers were there the entire time. And that's why it's so critically important to look back in the trailing 12 months to find how each rep builds their pipeline. And when you have those metrics, then you know when they're not hitting the leading indicators, which you could define as a sales activity. So we're looking at top of funnel activity, profiling, prospecting, multi-touch cadence, and all the activity to get um, net new qualified revenue that's added to the pipeline every single week, number of closes per month. You can get more granular looking at deals that progress through demo to proposal, et cetera, so that you have all the leading indicators. And you're managing to the early number, not to the closed number. Yeah. And I think that's that's a really important point that you that you hit on. And uh, I have uh, you know talked and written about this in the past and with some with other people as well, with other sales leaders, is that whole idea 
of early stage focus for for sales leaders because there is that tendency to focus in on the on the later stages of the pipeline and get in there and be helping closing and focused you know what can we do what can we do instead of going back and focusing on the early stage and saying, are these the right opportunities? Are they properly qualified? Have you done the right work? Should they even be in the pipeline? The, you know, that's where the focus should be, right? <laughs> should they even be in the pipeline? <laughs> Whoa, that right there is, it's just the Achilles heel of a mm-hmm. lot of sales organizations. I worked for a publicly traded Fortune 1000 payroll and HR company. And I learned pipeline management at a very young age, very mm-hmm. early in sales, because we couldn't screw around because we were reporting and forecasting to Wall Street. Right. And when I was selling in the mid market, we were we'd get our pipeline built for six to nine months out, sometimes even 12 months. And when you're forecasting that far out and those numbers are, are rolling up, mm-hmm. you are very uh, you're held very responsible to is this real revenue or not? In fact, we we had a push report and you never wanted your name on a push report, (laughs) meaning that you pushed revenue out from its original projected Mm. date. But because of that was our high performing sales culture. That's how I grew up in sales that I was, I learned that I needed qualified deals in my pipeline and that pipeline management was a way to protect me to make sure that I always had enough good revenue in the pipeline. Oftentimes reps just get so excited that to put anything in there, yeah. And they forecast bad business and then sales management's like, but look at everything in the pipeline. It's yeah. got to close. That's what, that's what I, I call that the feel good funnel, because <laughs> it doesn't matter how bad your sales are today. You can look back at stage one and two and go, but look, there's so much here that in, in, in three or six months time, we're going to have a bumper, you know, sales. And of course, when that comes around, you have a bad sales and you go, but look. Back at stage one again, you say yes, because you keep piling a lot of garbage into your early stages. Garbage in early stages. Couldn't have said it better myself. Mm. We, With our teams that we manage, we tell them they can't put the revenue in the pipeline until after discovery and they have to meet all mm. the minimum criteria for qualification. And we have to have a pain problem or undesirable result that we're solving and it has to be quantifiable. We have to have confirmation of budget timeline and uh, the decision-making process. And when we have all of those pieces, then it's allowed to be forecasted. But if you're missing even one of those, but it's interesting when you start managing teams with that mentality, we'll bring that mentality into teams and you'll watch reps. You'll tell them, like, you cannot forecast this yet because mm-hmm. we don't know the timeline. Right. And they will walk out of the office and go pick up the phone and call the prospect and figure out what the timeline is so they can project the revenue. And it creates that great behavior. Yeah. And that's and that's uh, and that's really critical because let's face it. I mean, when you do this work with um, with companies and, and with uh, CEOs and sales leaders, I'm sure you have that moment where you help them clean out the pipeline and that's and that and that's a little stressful isn't it where they you they say well we need five times our our <laughs> our our forecast in order to meet it and you, and you go yes but five if it's five times garbage it doesn't matter right so you have to manage them through that process of maybe seeing their whole pipeline shrink while you clean it up yeah and it's good. It's cleansing. It's necessary endings. It's get that out of there because um, I listened to Jeb Blunt at a conference recently and he says, if you're, if you're continuously just prospecting your pipeline, you're not prospecting that new business. Mm. And I feel like that would align with what you, you've just said. When we sit there and we keep working the same pipeline, the 5X pipeline, that's never going to go anywhere then we're not doing it. It's not of any service to ourselves. None of us are going to hit our metrics when we sit on a pipeline with non-qualified revenue and we just keep reaching out every two weeks and checking in, right? Mm -hmm. Which is absolutely terrible. Yeah. Type of follow up. Yep. Yes, it is. And then the question always is, is uh, OK, so what uh, between now and your next check in, what's the what's the buyer doing? Nothing. Right. No. They're not doing anything. So they're not actually engaged in the process. You're engaged in it, but they're not engaged in it. So how do you help? So how do you help then uh, uh, VPs and CEOs uh, keep this going? Because it's always when you transition something like the work you do, mm-hmm. there's an initial enthusiasm and then the work <laughs> maybe gets a little bit hard. So there's that kind of motivation dip, if you like. How do you help them through that? Yeah, I understand. We 
Uh, so our, we work in six month engagements mm-hmm. and we go on as fractional VPs of sales. Right. So we get pretty embedded uh-huh. in their culture. Okay. This is not a quick, like send your reps to training mm-hmm. and then we turn them around and they don't remember anything. This is a commitment that companies make. And because we get embedded in their culture for, for about six months, we do find that we get the longevity as we phase out. So one, to make things repeatable and scalable, you have to simplify them, but you have to turn it into a system. If it's too complicated, it's not sustainable. So a lot of our work, in order to have, when we step out of an organization to allow them to keep churning and and running, we make sure that everything that we build is sustainable long-term. So that starts with infrastructure. And then it's the, the culture and that mentality. So the sales manager and the sales leader, whoever is in place that we are working with, we take it upon ourselves to impart as much wisdom and give them as much support as we can. There's a huge gap in the market for developing sales leaders. I know you've heard this a mm-hmm. hundred times, probably this last month, that <laughs> you will promote your best sales performer. Yeah, yeah into sales management with no sales management or very sales management uh, training, mm-hmm. very little training. And then they don't succeed yeah. and they don't like it. And then or eight, you... eight, within 18 months, normally they're gone from the job. Right. And, that, and then you just lost your top sales person. So it's digging into that a little bit more and making sure that the sales management layer has the support. But with our with our work, with our sales managers, we will develop them in in their four key pillars. So one being motivating, that they know how to create a sales culture that's motivating to their intrinsic, extrinsic, and any altruistic uh, people that they have on the team. Then we look at their ability to coach. So when they're out in the field or they're in their one-to-ones or they're doing pre-call planning or debriefing, they're not telling them how to do that how to do what they need to be doing. They are coaching them through asking questions so that the rep is being developed and has buy-in and is being a, becoming a, a top performer there. Then we look at their accountability strategy, meaning what is pipeline management, mm-hmm. ensuring that the leading and lagging indicators are hit. And of course, their recruiting strategy because mediocrity can't happen. You have to separate the emotion from the people that you like and you have to acknowledge that a sales role is about performance. It's about numbers. And no matter how much you like someone, as I said earlier, Mm -hmm. you can still like somebody even though they work for a different company. If they're not producing for you, then they shouldn't have a spot on your team. That Those salespeople should earn that spot every month. So it's changing that mentality. But that's how when we phase out and we step out, they're developing the sales leader and sales manager with those four key pillars. And of course, building that great infrastructure on the front end, we've seen that it continues on and it will keep going because that's their new culture. Yeah. And I think that's great what you've outlined there because you're absolutely right is that uh, sales, man- sales management is such a pivotal role in an organization. And <laughs> It's the biggest revenue multiplier in my estimation because if you have a if you have a top performing sales manager they will do all the things that you talked about get the best out of their team rec- find the right team do all the right things and that that cumulatively will have a bigger impact on revenue. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, absolutely mm-hmm. it will. Okay, well, listen, thanks, Mary. We're bumping up against the end of our time. But before we go, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, a little bit more about Sales BQ and how they can learn more about you and the organization. Yeah, thanks. Well, my background, I worked for a payroll and HR company, Fortune 1000, and I was there for eight years. I started as a sales admin and got to study underneath a very accomplished regional sales manager that taught me how to build infrastructure and recruit A-level sales talent. And then when I went into sales, I became the number one rep in 30 days. Um, I sold millions for the company. I crushed lots of uh, quotas and records for them and then got into sales training in an effort to empower my peers. And I fell in love with that, created Sales BQ, and BQ is the behavioral quotient. Right now, we have a team of 10 people. We serve clients across the country. We're based in Denver, Colorado, and we go on as fractional VPs of sales. We work directly with another VP of sales at the client company or report to the CEO if they don't have one. And we rebuild the sales department, build, hire, drive, rebuild the infrastructure, systems, processes, have a, a beautiful output deliverable of a playbook and scorecards and comp plans and territory carve outs. Then we get into our higher phase. We have full service sales recruiting department here at SalesBQ. And for any deficit in talent, we will recruit source in place. And then the last part is driving profitable revenue growth. We will live stream all of our training every week. We do immersion style learning, which means learn a little practice and repeat, not an all day butts and seats forgettable mm-hmm. event where people don't learn. And then the back end of that is we do the in the field sales coaching and training with the reps for a period of three to five months to ensure that everything they're learning sticks. Wow. 
That's uh, that sounds very very comprehensive. So I would uh, encourage people to check out Sales BQ, uh, and uh, and absolutely, I think the more work you do with your sales management in whatever company you have, um, it will pay off hugely because we have to stop, as we said, we have to stop putting people in positions and setting them up to fail. Uh, and as you say, and then probably losing your top rep in the in the mix <laughs> as well. Uh, listen, Mary Grothy, this has been fantastic. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks.